Um, so in some ways, much of the, the meat of this is actually encapsulated by what, what James has said. So I'm going to rattle through these slides fairly quickly. If I'm going too fast, just shout, slow down. Um, I have a few slides here which uh, sort of go uh, over the, the history of the introduction of SIF, which when it was first published as a standard, uh, tended to munge together um, various aspects of format. Uh, there was syntax and there was definitions of uh, the data names that were being introduced in this particular syntactic framework. Um, but this is what a, an, an early SIF looked like, and it, uh, it had the benefit of being a very clean syntax, not too much clutter. Um, in 1996, MM SIF was formally introduced as a standard, and in terms of format, uh, syntactically, there was almost no difference between MM SIF and SIF, except that data names were seen to have a, a point character appearing, and uh, that was really the only, the only distinction at a, at a syntactic level. Um, in the year 2000, uh, formally image SIF was introduced uh, along with its partner CBF. Uh, again, at the syntactic level, uh, it was a simple extension to SIF, um, other than the fact that CBF allowed the, uh, the inclusion of binary data within the file. So this was for uh, reasons of um, file storage and access efficiency. Um, but as of 2016, uh, so imminently, um, there will be a, an upgrade to the syntactic elements of the, of the SIF format. Um, some new uh, wrapper, some new containers for data will be introduced. Uh, the basic character set will be extended to UTF-8. So in one sense, there is a significant uh, extension uh, of, the, of the syntactic level aspect of the format. Uh, now, the specification of this has just been submitted to Journal of Applied Crystallography. Um, so you should see that in, uh, in print in the next few months. So 2016 is probably a reasonable time to settle down and review the, the changes in the published work. Although, in fact, they're already available on the record in the, um, in the various SIF uh, discussion lists. Um, but in a sense, uh, I have a couple of slides which I've provocatively entitled the, the irrelevance of format. Um, so here is a, a typical uh, SIF file. Um, what can you do with it? Well, you can load it into an application and you can visualize a, a molecular structure. Or you can visualize, or you can load it into a different application and you can edit a scientific paper. So the same uh, file contents um, can be processed uh, by different applications um, so that the format in which they're input doesn't really uh, dictate what an application should do with it. The application parses the information and uses it as required. Here's a slightly different angle on that. Here is a structure from the PDB uh, that's represented in three different file formats. So on the left is the uh, original PDB file format. In the middle is a, an MM SIF formulation, and on the right is the PDBML, the XML representation that's used for interchange of the information between the nodes of the Worldwide Protein Data Bank. It's exactly the same information. In some sense, the format is different. Uh, the syntactic structure can be different. The uh, way in which the components are ordered in the file can be different. Um, but the underlying information is the same load the PDB file into JMOL, and you can visualize the, uh, the uh, micromolecular structure. Load the MM SIF into JMOL, and you get exactly the same representation. Well, not quite exactly. There's a little quirk that uh, by default it will render the MM SIF input uh, in a ball and stick model, but a, a single click will convert that into a cartoon representation. Um, but if you know the way these things work, you can see the underlying helices and beta strands by eye. Um, that's, a, that's a, a choice. Uh, JMOL is, in that sense, um, quite happy to input in different structures, different syntax, different formulations, different formats. And likewise, if you load the XML file in, oops, not quite, uh, JMOL crashes with an exception um, because the little linking uh, subroutine to parse the XML hasn't been written. Why not? Because it turns out that uh, in the wild, people don't use the XML format to interchange this type of graphical representation. It's used at the higher level of exchanging the, the bulk data between the nodes of the PDB. Um, 
Uh, but once we have practicing crystallographers who say, no, no, we must have it in XML because I've got tools that handle everything in XML, um, I will take Bob Hansen out to lunch and he will write a, an XML converter. So you can see that the format is not irrelevant. It does make some differences, some little tweaks, um, but it's not a major uh, problem in terms of interpreting the data. You just need to know the rules to transform the particular chosen format into the underlying information in the way in which you're happiest to, to understand and use it. This is just another example. Um, on the left is an image SIF. On the right is what you might get if you try to look at a CBF on screen. All the garbage at the bottom is the, the binary uh, form of the, uh, of the image. Um, and whichever format, or in this case, really encoding you provide, um, you can still see the, the same raw data in an appropriate visualization tool. Um, so at the syntactic level, SIF has been very stable. It's really only after um, oh, 25 years that this extension to the syntax is coming in. Uh, but during that time, its, um, its internal structure uh, has changed a little bit. So the decoupling of the semantics from the syntax has proceeded in a number of, uh, of stages. As I said, the initial paper was a little bit vague in that decoupling. Both syntax and semantics were presented together. Uh, by the mid-90s, uh, DDL1 uh, decoupled the semantics. It gave you the information about the meaning and relationship between data names uh, in a completely separate context. It itself was uh, in a machine-readable form um, and used the same syntactic form so that you could parse that uh, using the same software. Uh, in 1996, the, um, the point about MMSIF was not that it introduced a dot, but that the significance of the dot was that it took this decoupling of the syntactic elements from the semantic and focused on the semantic and said the relationships actually can be rigorously uh, translated or um, represented as a relational data model, as a model that you would have in a relational database. Uh, image SIF allowed you to handle binary data. That wasn't a significant inc increment in semantic terms. Um, but by the time of 2013, at, at the last workshop we had at an ECM, which was the ComSIFS workshop, um, we were beginning to look at uh, DDLM, the methods DDL that's been mentioned a couple of times in this workshop, as a way of, uh, of extending um, the semantic uh, relationships or the expression of the semantic relationships uh, between uh, elements in, uh, in the growing sort of repertoire of SIF applications. And SIF 2.0, I've mentioned, uh, does extend the character set and the data types that can handle. And that's done in part to make it easier to represent complex relationships in DDL and to use languages such as DREL to do things like validation and evaluation of missing data uh, based on the relationships that are expressed in a dictionary. So it's a very powerful way of taking a limited data set, a known set of relationships, and generating derivable um, information, derivable data, if that's not present. Um, we use the phrase DDL as dictionary definition language in the SIF world, in the world of relational databases. There's also an acronym DDL, the data description language, <coughs> Uh, and in relational database systems, that's the mechanism for characterizing relationships between items in the database, uh, between tables in the database, if you will. And the two, in fact, perform very similar functions. In the case of MMSIF, they're essentially identical. We demonstrated this early by um, uh, creating a schema for the world database of crystallographers as an MMSIF dictionary of uh, information about uh, persons in the database, um, and implemented that initially as a star file with star tools. So the very first world database of crystallography was a star file, a uh, glorified SIF, if you will. For performance reason, we eventually uh, re-implemented it as a, as a relational database system. And you can look into the, the structure of an RDBMS like Interbase, uh, and you can look at the, the DDL, the data uh, description language, uh, using various GUIs. You can expand them into the, uh, the express relationships 
And when you look at this after the workshop and can, can read the small print, you can amuse yourselves by seeing how the structure of the DDL on the right uh, maps very directly onto the structure of the DDL on the left. Um, so once you've set up these relationships, uh, you can then describe um, the MMSIF dictionary, for example, which is a huge morass of uh, individual definitions, um, in terms of uh, tabulated relationships between categories. So if you look at International Tables Volume G, the description of the MMSIF dictionary, the, the core to that descriptive text is the linkage between different categories in the dictionary. And these categories, as I say, map onto tables in the RDBMS version of the protein data bank. And this is um, a selection of the, uh, the detail within um, volume G. And on this side of the screen is what you get if you try to map all of those relationships. This is a graphical representation of the uh, protein data bank schema, um, which is, if you like, a graphical representation of the MMSIF dictionary. The two are isomorphous. Um, just some pictures of what a, a SIF dictionary definition looked like that you can uh, play with at your leisure. Um, notice that uh, in some cases, um, we began by expressing uh, the relationship between the item that you're considering, the cell volume, and other items that there might be in the file um, in a purely textual representation. This was for the benefit of uh, programmers who would read the SIF dictionary, transcribe that into whatever code they were using. Uh, the um, development of DDLM and DREL means that you can encode the same type of information in a language that is interpretable directly by an appropriate interpreter. So you can write software that reads the dictionary and evaluates a, um, a volume. So you, you, you can ask the SIF data file, what is the volume of this cell? If that data value is not present in the SIF, but the, uh, the cell vector components are, um, then the DREL machine can evaluate that without knowing anything about crystallography, simply from the declarative information in the, in the dictionary. And the dictionary is, um, if you like, um, a, a metadata relational statement. And they can be arbitrarily complex. So this is very compact uh, language DREL, which encodes quite complex mathematical operations, succinctly tuned well to the relational structure of the data items in the dictionary. Um, very quickly, uh, we have a range of dictionaries that have been managed by COMSIFs uh, since the early 1990s. Uh, they, cover various, sorry, they cover various aspects of uh, crystallographic um, science. Um, since the uh, late 90s, uh, the WWPDB has really taken over the management of the micromolecular dictionary and its extensions. And in order to uh, capture more experimentally biased metadata, uh, they've gone out and they have had a number of task forces which have devised extensions that will bring in information about uh, small angle scattering or electron microscopy experiments. This is all part of the PDB's efforts to, uh, to harvest as much metadata related to the structure as possible. Those are the official dictionaries. There are a couple of, uh, there are a few private dictionaries which the IUCR will manage. So for our own journals, for the CCDC, um, and for legacy applications, there are a number of dictionaries that you can download from the IUCR data, uh, from the IUCR website. Um, they all form part of uh, additional namespaces that um, can be tracked uh, through our CIF registry. Uh, but you also find that we have a number of software developers and databases that have reserved namespaces with the IUCR, which allows them to devise their own SIF data names that will not conflict with the official dictionaries or with other people who register under this namespace um, uh, protection mechanism. And that means, in principle, there are, there are about 40 of them. So there may well be up to 40 different um, characterizations of metadata that have been uh, undertaken by software authors, by database people, 
Um, uh, and they're not, they're not known to us, but they're all in the format that we can simply pull them in and integrate them with the official dictionaries if the need arises. Very often these are for private software development, um, but because they're using our formalism, uh, they could form a bridge uh, with other applications. Um, there are a number of uh, commissions which are, uh, as charged by the Triple D Working Group, uh, they're looking to extend uh, their own metadata definitions, and a number of them are using SIF format to do so as well. Um, the benefit for crystallography is that, uh, although the format is not completely irrelevant, a common format makes it much easier to uh, travel between applications. And so we have, at the very least, a conceptual linkage between the items that we define um, within the synchrotron, the images that are captured, the data reduction software or the solution software, through to publication, promulgation to the databases, the structures that are fed out to the world outside. Um, at the very least, SIF as a common conceptual framework has given us a nice model of the, the data flow um, through all the stages of uh, information transfer in crystallography. And I call this a, a coherent information flow because it has the nice acronym CIF. Uh, but of course, you can take this neat little um, construct of, of the IUCR and partners and say, well, the problem is that it exists in a, in a broader world. Uh, you need to capture the scientific context for the experiment from the, from the chemists, uh, from the people who have prepared the, um, the experiment in the first place. And that needs to feed in um, to the crystallographer's view of things using the sort of limbs capture that, uh, that Simon was talking about. Um, the scientific resource behind this is very general. Uh, there are aspects of the, the equipment, the beam line, the funding and so on that also have to be captured and, and fed into this, uh, into this pipeline. And of course, you can multiply this. Um, so all of this thing at the bottom left is sort of what we're most familiar with them among this audience. Um, but for the wider world, there are other things. How does this interact with uh, repositories, um, with, uh, with you know, the, the, um, the impact factor of your eventual um, journal of choice? Uh, how does it feed into the semantic web, which tends to use a somewhat different formalism, but is semantically something that we can map onto that? And of course, not only do these all need to interact with the crystallographer's view of the world, but there's a lot of interchange between all these different modules. Uh, and this is really just to emphasize the importance of James's uh, discussion, that all of these different nodes are probably using different formalisms, different frameworks. And it's very important that they recognize uh, that what is important is the actual nature of the relationships that they're encoding. And if we begin efforts to harmonize and to translate between these relationships, the sort of format converter that James was talking about, this has enormous benefits, not just within our own closed world, uh, but with all of the, um, the semantic web, if you will, with, with the information universe. So I hope that made some sense. Uh, the, the SIF effort has uh, benefited over the last 25 and more years by input from at least these people. I think everyone in this room, if you're not already there, I will add your name to the list when I go back. Uh, because in talking about uh, information and data in crystallography and its cognate sciences, you're all, whether you know it or not, contributing to the work of COMSIFS. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Brian. Questions to Brian. James. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, one, uh, one thing I perhaps uh, think is important to um, be specific about here is what we mean when we say format. So if we're going to be strict about it, I would suggest when we say format, we should be referring to something like HDF5. Uh, but in, in general use, we seem to be saying format is the actual syntax plus how one discipline has decided they want to encode their information into that. And so I think it's, it's always useful to be clear about that particular distinction. Um, the other comment I'd make is that uh, you showed that DREL method. 
And what I would uh, underline is that you can go through any of, our, any of these DDLM dictionaries and uh, you have a very clear functional relationship, as I was discussing, between um, the data name and other data names. And you can actually algorithmically go through that and extract all the dependencies in that mathematical expression. And I have, have done that for the core dictionary. And you can actually build an automatic, if you like, description of how these uh, data names are related to each other. And then that could feed into the, to the, um, the, the effort to integrate with other, other um, metadata initiatives without any real work needing to be done, sort of manual labor. And the final point I would make <laughs> is that uh, I, I went a bit, uh, I was very, um, I tiptoed around the fact, but essentially uh, the outcome of what I was talking about is that you can represent scientific knowledge in a relational database, full stop. So all of those metadata initiatives, no matter what format they're using, can be reduced to relational database expressions with no loss of scientific information. And so that may well end up being the, the route to uh, unification or uh, virtual unification, not saying it all has to be kept in one giant database. Just comment. So thank you very much. I, I plead guilty to imprecision in the use of the term format, but then it's clear that um, all of these terms uh, have at, at best fuzzy definitions. Um, James and I are, have the pleasure of working together as editors of uh, the forthcoming new edition of International uh, Tables Volume G. When I say forthcoming, there is no time scale on that as yet. Um, but we will try to make the, the next edition um, much more uh, general, um, it will still contain all the crystallographic content because it's an IUCR publication, these are crystallographic standards. Uh, but I think we want to try and make very clear uh, that this is not different from the types of standardization efforts in any other field of, of science or human endeavor. Okay, any other comments, questions? I think it's worth recording the fact I think I perhaps said it already, that the fantastic success of the uh, CIV, the crystallographic information framework, um, I mean, it's uh, totally adopted by all of those journals publishing crystal structures. Um, I perhaps witnessed the start of uh, the chemical crystallographers when I joined the IUCR Journal Commission in 1990, hammering out the uh, core metadata and the standards that they, they felt should be insisted upon. I mean, it's a terrific achievement of the chemical crystallographic community. And the people like yourselves, uh, Brian, James, uh, you know, and Sid Hall, obviously. Um, anyway, needs to be said. Right, so thank you very much, uh, Brian. <laughs>